Welcome to the WebRTC Working Group June Virtual Interim. A reminder about the W3C Working Group IPR policy. We abide by the patent policy and only people and companies listed are allowed to make substantive contributions. I wonder whether we need a bot policy, but we don't have one at the moment, I guess. So uh, we're going to cover use cases, ice controller, uh, some custom STP stuff from Harold, and uh, probably a few other things. Uh, we have meetings scheduled for July in the future. We don't have one for August because traditionally that's been vacation month. And then we're going to have a whole bunch of meetings at TPAC. Uh, so lots of lots of time together then in September and then back on a normal schedule for the rest of the year. A little bit about the code of conduct. We do operate under a W3C code of ethics and professional conduct. We're all passionate about improving what we see. Let's keep it cordial and professional. So you probably all know this by now, but the session is being recorded and you raise your hand to get into the queue in order to get out. And please wait for mic microphone access. Tell us who you are. I don't think we'll use Pulse today, but we could. So uh, a little bit about document status. Just because something's in the repo doesn't mean it's a, been adopted. That's a separate thing. Requires a call for adoption. Editor's drafts don't represent consensus. Working drafts do. Um, and it's possible to merge PRs that lack consensus. We'll be talking about that in the end of use case discussion a little bit later. Okay, so here's what's on the agenda. Uh, we have a lot of talking about media capture screen share, uh, a little bit about WebRTC extensions from FIPPO. We're going to talk about every use cases, ICE controller, and encoded transfer and codec negotiation from Harold. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Elad. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about three different topics today. Uh, Try to keep it brief because uh, there is three and there is only 20 minutes. So next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so first, a reminder. So somewhat recently, we introduced something called Capture Controller, which is an object that we... Yeah, sorry. Um, Harald does ask the question. I'll just wait for that. Do we have somebody taking notes? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. Uh, I am taking notes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dom. So uh, we've recently introduced something called Capture Controller, which is an object that we can instantiate and then we can tie it to a capture session, which means that once you do that, the Capture Controller can no longer be associated with anything else and it is tied to that lifetime of that session. And uh, at the moment, um, we only have single use for it, but all things start like that, right? Uh, at the moment, we're only using it for set focus behavior and I suggest that if we want to make it more easily usable by other specs and uh, and that some of which we will eventually merge into the current one, uh, it helps to make it into an event target. And we already have a, a specific use case in mind in the screen capture mouse events spec. And we can think about other reasons, uh, what other use cases. Uh, these are not to be debated right now. These are just hypothetical, but you can imagine that maybe you want to fire events when the surface changes, right? Like if the user pre presses in Chrome, share this tab instead, or in Safari, uh, there is an accelerator that allows you to change uh, into sharing another window, etc. cetera. Um, so that's uh, the proposal. What do you guys think? So uh, the recording is not going to capture that, but UN has just raised both thumbs and then the uh, new Safari uh, reaction appeared. So I see Henrik Bustrom saying thumbs up. Uh, Yanivar, I did not get your response. Here we go. Yanivar says, we don't have any slides for that as far as I know. Uh, Yanivar? Uh, I think that was an answer to another question. I think so too. Uh, Yanivar? Any uh, thoughts about 268? 
Okay, looks like everybody is on board, so we will merge the PR. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, uh, looks good to me. Awesome, thank you. 263, uh, improve upon uh, capture start, focus behavior, no focus change. So at the moment, uh, it's basically, uh, it goes like this. When you start capturing a tab or a window, uh, there's the question of what needs to be in focus, whether it's the window that you've just started capturing or whether it's the browser that needs to still be in focus. Uh, we've discussed this in the past and we decided that this is something that should actually be left up to the uh, web application to at least uh, give a preference for, and I'm sorry, uh, voice a preference for, and then the um, user agent is free to actually take that into account or to ignore it. Um, so initially we had two enum values, one uh, focus captured surface and one no focus change. And it has been pointed out that no, no focus change, uh, sorry, calling your video is very uh, distracting because it keeps on flashing and uh, I could not get your Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we've discussed this and no focus change is actually a little bit uh, ambiguous given uh, Safari's model because in Safari, uh, what happens is you, when get display media is called, there is a macOS level picker that allows you to basically click on the window itself that you want to capture. And at that moment, no focus change is less ambiguous than it would be, for example, in Chrome. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my proposal is that we add uh, focus capturing application, and this way we've got an unambiguous uh, value. The existing uh, implementation, existing implementations like Chrome, can keep no focus change and redefine it as keep uh, in focus whichever surface was last focused following the user's interaction with the user agent and/or operating system. So basically, for Chrome, uh, this would still uh, mean keep the browser itself in focus. And for Safari, this would mean cap, uh, focus the uh, captured window. And longer term, we might want to actually deprecate the old confusing value. What do you say? Uh, yes, you're in. Um, I like option one. It's, uh, it's good. I like it. Um, I wonder whether we want to keep no focus change. So maybe we should add like a, a warning note in the spec saying, hey, we plan to deprecate no focus change. And uh, when Chrome is ready, uh, Chrome uh, might be able to deprecate it. But uh, I think it would be good for the spec to be clear from the start uh, of the direction we want to take, even though implementations will catch up later. So, um... Uh, I would prefer to not use language so strong as like we plan. Uh, I think that we need to think about it a bit more, but like definitely having two values instead of three uh, is seems preferable. I just want to see if it's feasible. Uh, I need to check with how many applications actually call, um, you know, the old value and how difficult it's going to be to migrate them. What do you say to that, Yuan? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we, we should definitely basically... add the value first, uh, and then we can continue discussing for the deprecation. Uh, I see Tim and yeah. Yonivar, so let's, let's uh, have them on board. Awesome. Uh, Tim, I think I saw you first. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's all, what I wanted to say was kind of almost covered, which is that I would really like to know whether deprecating it now is an issue or not because obviously the best thing to do is de deprecate it as soon as possible but i don't have any input on when soon is or when it's possible but i would like to know i agree in principle that deprecating it seems preferable uh i can think of counter arguments but so far they're not convincing to me uh but before we go so far as to commit to a deprecation uh i would like uh some time to consult the data on usage uh, anybody? Uh, yeah, so for other browsers that are going to implement this, knowing whether we need to implement two or three values is going to be important because this is this, this is uh, by, by DL enum, uh, it will throw if you try to provide a value of no focus change. So applications that provide that value would uh, get errors potentially in 
Firefox, for example, which would be uh, so. Uh, I understand. Uh, maybe I could um, commit to a time, you know, to a reasonable time to actually come back with an answer. But uh, Harold, what do you think? I see that you're on the queue. If we have uh, deployed code that uses this, then the usual metric is that you don't break running code. So if running code uh, uh, uses no focus change, then uh, we need to make mo both no focus change and focus capturing application available for some time, and then uh, and then uh, remove the the less used option. And so uh, I would say we need at least for some time to implement three. I think that's also what UN uh, was suggesting, but basically, uh, before knowing how um, widely adopted this already has been, I cannot actually say how quickly we can get rid of it, whether we could get rid of it at all. So uh, basically, I agree in principle, and I just want more time before committing. Uh, UN? Yeah, I think I agree with Harald. I think the point is really to say, uh, in, in the spec, the direction is this one, and we, we are committing to, to this direction. But we know that implementations will will need some time to to adjust, and uh, hopefully, if we if we if we give that direction now, then uh, it will be easier for Safari or Mozilla to implement uh, uh, the stuff without too much hassle. So I guess Chrome would uh, add uh, console warnings first, and and so on, try to engage with developers and so on, uh, which takes time, of course. Uh, Tim? Yeah, I just wanted to, like, probably offline, I'd like to see whether there's a way to make it so that there only two are valid in a given implementation. So a given browser, only only two of which are valid. And then uh, the if you get the throw, then you, you know you should be doing the other one. Uh, I'm sorry? So I'm, I'm suggesting that we should implement only any given implementation should only do two. Um, you can put all like you could make three in the spec, but indicate that typically only two are implemented and which two depends on which browser. Um, I'm not sure that's good for web compat though. I think uh, if, if we want to, uh, I think we should add a note in the spec to say which one's preferred so that users we look at the spec, know which one to use going forward. Otherwise, uh, I don't feel that we will be able, ever able to deprecate it. I agree with you never here. I, I don't think that it makes sense for any given user agent to um, to implement a different subset. Uh, by the way, there, it's not like there are no arguments for uh, retaining no focus change, right? You can imagine that an application, for example, doesn't care one way or the other, and all it wants is to minimize the changes of active window on the screen uh, not, so as not to annoy the user. So maybe no focus change is just a way for the application to say whatever, just don't, uh, don't move too much, which could be useful, for example, for users with accessibility issues, maybe. Um, so I think that it would be good to first uh, take the consensus that we've got here about adding an additional value that helps uh, Apple, and then discuss separately whether we want to deprecate the old value. Uh, there was a thumbs up with, uh, from Yanivar, Yuen, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that's fine, as long as uh, we come to a conclusion for uh, the deprecation uh, in a timely manner. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Uh, if you file a bug, I will, uh, sorry, an issue, I will uh, engage with it. Well, I, I filed the issue where we have that. So what, what we can do is just to not close the one I filed about uh, okay. focus capture and so on. Okay, so when we merge the PR, I'll make sure to reopen the bug, uh, the issue, if it's uh, closed. Awesome, uh, thank you so much. Uh, anybody else, any input? Okay, so seems like we've got consensus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, third and last issue. So um, uh, this is a proposal to allow applications to avoid riskier display surfaces. Um, 
I'm going to use Chrome as an example, but obviously uh, you can all um, make the jump to your other browsers. Uh, at the moment, it is possible. Um, I'm sorry. I'm proposing to add a constraint that would allow an application to say, hey, only offer tabs and windows under the assumption that the current uh, screen is the most risky option. Next slide, please. So I just want to explain uh, a sample use case that explains this. So uh, let's imagine that there is some video conferencing application called HypeComp uh, for hypothetical uh, company, right? Sorry. So that's not the application, that's the company. And they've got uh, employees and the employees routinely speak to each other over video conferencing applications, specifically one called VC app. And let's say that the admin wants to configure it so that uh, whenever two people who are both uh, HypeComp employees speak to each other, they can share anything, you know, they can get uh, troubleshooting, they, uh, they can, you know, do anything together, just like as if one of them just walked over to the other one's desk. But if anybody external is invited to the meeting, uh, it is not actually possible to share your entire screen because that poses a bit of risk to a company IP. Uh, in that case, uh, we don't currently have any way of doing that. Uh, there are two ways, but they're suboptimal. No, I'm sorry, we don't have any way of doing that uh, sufficiently well. Uh, one way is to use a policy, but that basically means that you can never share your entire screen, so that doesn't let you let two employees collaborate productively. And uh, the other option is to say that the VC app is going to immediately terminate the capture whenever somebody tries to join. Sorry, that's not what I meant to say. Uh, VC app could just uh, terminate the capture every time the user chooses the wrong thing. And obviously, that's not exactly nice for the users. Uh, they make mistakes, they get confused, and they get frustrated. Um, there is also the issue of users joining the meeting um, on the fly, right? So the application could theoretically terminate uh, a share that's already started right before an external user uh, joins, and that's going to be easy. Uh, but if you're already sharing a tab and now you want to dynamically change to sharing uh, the entire screen, something that's almost possible in Safari, where you can change from window to uh, entire screen, for example, um, that's also going to be a problem because the moment you do that, you might accidentally let slip a frame, right? So without actually instructing the UA to never allow capturing the entire screen, you're not going to be able to allow that uh, change. So that's my proposal. Uh, I think there might be one more slide here. Yes. Uh, security. Um, so right now, the spec this allow, uh, for Get Display Media, this allows constraining user choice, but we do have a carve out. Uh, we already have a precedent where we allow uh, to say that we don't want to capture the current tab. And that is both to prevent Hall of Mirrors, but also uh, because we know that the current tab is actually the riskier one. So if the application wants to open riskiest one, so if the application wants to avoid that one, uh, it's all the better for security. And I claim that uh, when you capture the current screen, which most users actually only have a single screen, uh, then it's the exact same case. So if we're going to allow an option to remove that, we're increasing security, we're not uh, reducing it. Um, what do you think? Yes, you are? Uh, you're muted. I'm muted. Uh, if um... If we have auto pose, is that, is that still an issue? I guess probably not. Um, we, we have uh, preferences for user to correctly uh, select. So I would think that at the um, uh, picker uh, decision point, uh, the web application is already like moving the user towards the right choice. So I, I think it's fine. Um, the issue might be at the point where dynamically you change from one surface to another, uh, like available in, in, in some macOS versions. In, in which case, uh, I think that autopose would be a would be a, a good solution, a better solution, because it's allowing, for instance, uh, the application to know that there's a riskier surface that is being shared and re react upon it. 
So it, it will be paused until the user, from, until the web page shows a message to the user and the user will will say, okay, uh, I cannot actually uh, select this. I will select something else and it will restart. Or a uh, user will say, hey, I am i don't care. I really want to share my screen and the application will say, okay, uh, that's fine as well and so on. So uh, I'm thinking that maybe auto pause plus the current uh, preferences might be good enough. So um, I'm glad that you uh, like Autopause. Uh, I actually uh, have a V2 that I would like to pitch to you. Uh, but regardless, when the user is offered the current screen, uh, that's already a point where uh, things are go off the rails, right? Because the user does not necessarily understand that they shouldn't choose that. And when they do that, that costs time, that uh, derails discussions during a meeting, and it's just not a good experience. So. And we don't currently have any preferences that allow us to remove that. So I think that it would be useful if uh, following on this foot, in the footsteps of self-browser surface, uh, we allowed also, you know, monitor exclusion. And I didn't really, other than claiming that autopause is sufficient, I didn't really understand why you were against it. Well, self-browser surface is just a preference, like, uh like over over things, so um, I, I would think that it might be good enough to have a preference, uh, I but but not not a hard requirement. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, if uh, if you could go one uh, slide back, please. Sorry, two slides back. Uh, Bernard, yes, thank you so much. So I, this is basically almost copy pasted from self browser surface. So it's also, it's only, uh, it's only a preference. And the idea is that it would just uh, be a hint to the user agent, but the user agent would be free to ignore it. Oh, okay. So it's, it's not a hard requirement. Okay. Uh, yes. Then that's different, I guess. Mm. Mm. So what would Chrome do then in, in this case? There will be only Chrome tab and window and not screen. Exactly, like the mock shows. Uh, I'll see what there's in the queue. Um, it sounds like you, you're coming around to it. Uh, I don't particularly like it because, uh, for instance, in in the Mac OS, uh, the user might be able to dynamically switch to the screen, for instance, and this will not be uh, a Chrome UI; it will be OS UI. So there, you could you could Chrome could show the picker, and then the user would be able to override it, and then Chrome would, uh, for instance, end the track. It it, it seems like. Uh, it's not uh, totally consistent there. And currently, our approach was always a preference, not a hard requirement on uh, disallowing user selection. So it's uh, it's it's a different step there. Um, sorry for the people in the queue for uh, monopolizing this. Just a second. Uh, so I think that for Safari, this would actually be quite useful because yeah, Safari has quite a lot of uh, clicks right now, right? You first click a display media, then you get a dialogue that's kind of you know um, delayed by a by a, a random amount of time, right? And then you need to say if you want a window or a screen. And now imagine if uh, if the application is already four going to this. Left. Thank you so much. So if uh, the application is already going to discard any kind of uh, any selection of a screen, now the user clicks uh, to uh, select the screen, then they choose a screen, and then it gets discarded. And then the user needs to go through all of this again, this time choosing window, not screen. Like this is quite laborious. So I think that for Safari, this would be uh, an improvement. And also in terms of dynamic switching, like you know the operating system could theoretically Avoid offering dynamically switching to an entire screen if, if this is how it got initiated. Uh, you let's you double click the team manual. Let's have team manual. Uh, we only have three minutes now. Okay. Uh, team, you were first, I think. So I like this in principle, but I think it's going to be very difficult to implement it in a way that isn't surprising to the users. Uh, I, I suspect that in the end, 
like, why can't I share my screen? It's going to be the um, dominant response to this because it's unexpected. Like it, it varies from meeting to meeting and even if it's done right. So I, I think I'm kind of moderately against it unless somebody comes up with a UX proposal, which makes it clear what the heck's going on and, and kind of warns the user that this is why. So uh, it's not clear to me how this is more confusing than uh, the application just terminating the screen capture and showing a, uh, um, a warning to the user of like your bad user chose wrong thing, chose right thing next time. So, so the proposal is that in this in this picker that we're looking at here, the, the whole screen just simply isn't an option. Yes, but that's just an illustration, right? So, like, so the, so the, exactly. So the instant response to this screen is, well, why can't I share my screen? I could yesterday. You know, that's going to be the what I'm going to hear from half the users is why have I suddenly lost the ability to screen share the screen? And I could do it two minutes ago on another call. And so, like, I, I think I'm not a, I'm pro the security benefit from this, and I think it is possible to do it in a way that's user friendly. But I think it's much harder than you think to get it over to users what it is that they're losing and why. So I think that your application doesn't have to call that unless it thinks that it's got a way to communicate to the user that the screen will not be acceptable. Uh, and if you don't want that, then you don't need to specify that particular preference. And applications are free to not call that until such a time as they believe the browser actually found a good model of communicating to the user why uh, something is not possible. Uh, but sorry, uh, Yanivar and Colin are on the queue. I think Yanivar first. Oh yeah, so uh, this one was a little tough for me, but I, I, I thank you for presenting the use case. I think the use case makes a lot of sense, and I, I do believe I, I think I support this because normally, I, I dis, I dislike that we're limiting user choice, but also I feel like selecting the uh, full screen is a risky choice, and I'm glad that we have ways to remove that. So I, I, overall, I think I'm supportive. I think my. My one question is, uh, since we have we follow the same include exclude model, which I agree is good for consistency, it does leave open a question of what the default is, I guess, which yeah. would be how um, browsers work today. We're out of time on this section. Okay, uh, is it possible to ask everybody who's interested to maybe uh, engage on this on GitHub so that we could continue there? Awesome, thank you very much. Okay. So, a message from FIPO. Well, I'm glad I could make it. Thanks, Bernard. So, uh, this is a continuation of the pull request to request keyframes. And the last time we agreed that adding a Boolean to the encoding parameters it's, is not the way to go because it's not persistent, unlike other parameters. The new proposal is to add a second parameter to set parameters. And this should be an optional sequence of video encoder encode options, same length as the encoding parameters, and reusing the video encoder encode options object from Web Codex, which has a Boolean keyframe flag. The question I have to the working group is whether this is the first time we reuse Web Codex IDL in WebRTC directly, and do we want to go in that direction? And it looks like Jan Ivar has an opinion. Ah, uh, yes. So thank you. I like this improvement. Uh, I think that's the right way to go. As far as reusing WebIDL dictionaries from other specs, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, we've done that before. For instance, uh, get display media and get viewport media had the same options object. But then when things get added in the other spec, suddenly you now have implicitly taken on extra code. And, and, and people will read that to mean, just because someone adds some new web codex options doesn't mean we want to support them here. So I think uh, you know our budget for WebIDL dictionary is, uh, is pretty, pretty good. So I think we could just make our own copy. Yes, also note that the web codex variant actually has codex specific options these days. All righty, for VP8 and I think AV1 and we wouldn't want to support them. Okay, for Laurent, then you end, I think. Yeah, um, I think that is the right approach. And 
we probably want to keep a dictionary with keys that are compatible with the web codex one as much as possible. Uh, if any encoding parameters, encoding options uh, make sense to implement as well in Wubodice, then we might consider them in the future. Uh, for now, if we only had keyframe, that would be fine by me. Okay, let's go in. You're muted. Yeah, I mean, I, I dropped, I was dropped out of the call, so maybe it was uh, already given feedback, but uh, Web Codex Dictionary is a uh, frame and um, set parameters is not per frame. So there might be mismatches between the Web Codex uh, Dictionary and the codec we, we want. So that, that's why I prefer that we have our own uh, dictionary and we, we keyframe would be a uh, de definition would be uh, a link to the web codex spec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's similar to what Yaniva said. Sorry, I jumped back on the queue. I had some more questions. Okay, so if good. I specify false, what does that mean? Am I preventing keyframes? Um, no, you're not requesting one. So, and and if if I set do a set parameter so I have no changes whatsoever, and then I set keyframe true, then it generates a keyframe. Yes. Right. But the encoder can at any time decide to generate a keyframe because it needs one. Yeah, it's a bit of an odd API, but I, I guess it makes sense that we want to synchronize it. Sure. Huh? Uh, yes, um, one more question regarding set parameters. It's supposed to return the promise, uh, when, to resolve the promise when all the parameters have been applied. Do we want to uh, have set parameters uh, to resolve uh, when the keyframe has been uh, created and sent, or do we want to have it uh, when all the other parameters have been applied? knowing that the keyframe will follow uh, soon after. What would be the uh, sequencing for set parameters? I see. In the past discussions, we concluded that we can't really know when a keyframe is generated by the encoder, which is at the encoder's discretion. And we get this issue with what if we request keyframes on multiple layers? Do we wait for all of them, any of them? So I would say we don't wait for keyframe generation before resolving this, which would also not change the existing timing behavior. That sounds good to me. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Make sure to include this in the PR. Yes. Bernard. Yeah, uh, to Florence's point, I think, I think the thing, Florence, is you're not waiting for the keyframe to be generated. You're waiting for the encoder parameter to be passed, if that makes sense. Um, it does. It does. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll update the PR and introduce a similar object as Web Codex, but not reuse it. Any other questions, or can we move on? Okay. I think I think we're done with this. Thank you. Thank you, Pippo. All right. So next topic is a discussion of NV use cases. So to remind you, uh, we had this list of proposals from the main meeting. And the first was to rename the document to extended use cases. And we've done that. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of the proposals. And Tim will talk about two more of them. Um, the one I'll talk about is removing use cases that don't add new requirements. We'll also probably cover this in the July meeting with some of the other items on this list and kind of work through them over time. All right, so I have two PRs relating to removing use cases that don't add new requirements. One of them relates to Section 3.9, which is reduced complexity signaling. The other is relating to the machine learning use case, which is Section 3.7. And so the thing I'd like the working group to consider is whether we need these use cases and if we do, what value they add. All right, so section 3.9 is reduced complexity signaling. Um, 
I don't know, Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about what you had in mind here? Sure. I mean, I, I, it's really a question. I, the original idea was to sort of get something where you could drop into uh, a, a URL that you could, URI, you could drop into the source attribute of a, of, a, of, an, uh, of a video or an image and you would get like magic would happen underneath and suddenly you'd get a stream into that uh, element without you having to do any kind of conscious offer answer. Um, and like the objection at the time is, well, hey, you can do this with, with a JavaScript library and, and this is fair. And, and that's kind of been proven by the fact that that's pretty much what, well, Wish is doing, the Wish and Whip are doing in, uh, currently in, in just for capture, but are talking about doing for playback as well. And so kind of the, the argument that, hey, there's a, there could be a library for this um, is sort of borne out. So I'm, I, I think that there's a good case for saying, well, yeah, okay, the libraries will be sufficient, um, unless there's something that we that we think that Wish or Whip or somebody else isn't going to cover in a library because it needs assistance from the user agent to achieve. Um, and I don't see any evidence for that yet. Yeah, thank you, Tim. I guess uh, the slide isn't quite right because it's not the WIP protocol that gives you what you asked for. It's the WEP protocol, right? The yeah, which, protocol. which to, to be fair, hasn't been implemented yet. Um, I mean, right. the, the spec right. is, is still like not a spec. So, um, but I think the indication of the where the WISH working group is going gives you reasonable right. confidence that it will happen. Yeah, and I will I will say that in future meetings we're going to discuss the streaming aspect, which is also related to WIP and WEP. Uh, so the question is whether, given that it has no requirements, and maybe it, maybe we can get some of this discussion in streaming, whether we can remove this use case. Uh, any thoughts? So, so the only reason for not removing it in my mm -hmm. view, is is this feeling that I still have, which I think the, the rest of the group doesn't have, that the role of this document is somewhat to encourage developers that their minority use of WebRTC is a valid one and that like, they're not going to have the rug pulled out from underneath them by changes mm -hmm. in the spec in the future. I think that's the only reason for keeping this. Um, and as far as I remember from the non-consensus last month. I don't think anybody else in the group has, <laughs> has the same opinion as me on that. Yeah, it is an interesting question though, Tim, because obviously uh, the WISH working group, which developed WIP and WEP, did feel it was a valid use case. So I'm not sure that it's up to us to tell them it's not, <laughs> if you see what I'm saying. Right. And, 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 uh, Along with the other thing that we kind of, I think we did agree last time, which is that um, the 78, 74, things that aren't in 78, 74, but that we do think are valid use cases need a home somewhere. Um, and, and this, I think, is one of them. But maybe streaming covers it. Yeah, any other thoughts? Does anybody? I see Yanivar in the queue. OK. Yanivar? Yeah, just, just to confirm what you mentioned about last month, yeah, I think uh, I don't see why we would need to keep use cases for the ITF. I'm not sure we're the right place for it. And I would support that our use cases are mostly to drive decisions and work within this working group. Uh, and I think that's fair, but the headline is that 78, 74 is the definitive list of use cases. Yeah. So we're already tied to the ITF. Yeah. So I'll go on since I raised my hand. Uh, I think this particular document should only focus on things that brings new requirements. But but I do agree with you, Tim, that there is value in documenting somewhere usages that aren't driving new requirements, but that people have started to rely on, just so that when we change something, we can refer to this and verify we're not creating new performance issue or new blocker 
Uh, I'm skeptical the working group has the bandwidth for this, uh, and I'm not entirely sure how we would detect when such a change occurs that it would create an issue. I mean, maybe with something automated at, at, at la web platform test, we, we could get there. Um, so uh, right, I guess right. I, I support the intent, but, but uh, I'm not sure the working group right now is well equipped to uh, achieve this, I guess. Yeah, this isn't the document that defines what WPT is supposed to cover, right? I mean, which is the only way I think you could address that. Anyway, uh, let me ask this question. I don't know, I guess we, we're not gonna vote or anything, but is there any objection in this uh, room at least to removing section 3.9? Okay, uh, so I guess we can put that in the notes. We'll discuss, Dom, whether we need to go to a formal CFC or not, but, uh, oh, Harold has a question. Harold. Well, that, that was just a sen sending a scratching of my head note. So you're not sure? I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, I don't think I can raise um, a, a strong objection against removing it. Okay. All right. So next one is PR 113, which is removing the machine learning use case. So um, this one also doesn't add any requirements beyond those for funny hats, which is section 3.6. Um, now, one subtle difference between this and funny hats is that um, funny hats really is, is largely about doing things with graphics manipulation. So it included requirement N22, which was efficient media manipulation via GPUs. And that requirement, I think, made some sense for funny hats, but it's included here as well. And that, if you think about it, um, is a little bit odd because efficiently doing media manipulation is not quite the same thing as efficient machine learning. So as an example, there are different ways to accelerate machine learning, which would include things like Wasm SIMD for the case of audio. There are now MPUs, which are uh, in many cases preferred to GPUs for accelerating machine learning. So it's a little bit odd that this use case focuses entirely on GPUs as opposed to other things. But then the next question is, well, that's great. Why are you, why is this working group making requirements for what, how the web supports GPUs or Wasm SIMD or MPUs for that matter? Um, because machine learning performance, which is, I guess, what that requirement about, isn't in scope for this working group. Um, and it is in scope, presumably, for other working groups in the W3C, like the machine learning working group. Uh, and of course, the web GPU working group owns, owns GPU-related uh, stuff. And WASM is developed in the WASM working group. So, um, that, uh, so that, that brings up a number of questions in my mind. A, it doesn't have any new requirements, but also uh, even though, even, you know, we obviously think machine learning is important in the W3C, but what could we, what does the WebRTC working group have to do with that um, specifically? Uh, okay, comments, uh, UN. Um, yeah, re related to N22, uh, I think that um, we should look at what we're defining. And uh, if you want efficient media manipulation, you, you need a good video frame object that we are not defining. You, you need to have a right, right. video frame, good integration with well GPU and yeah, so yeah, yeah. on. We are not defining this. Right. So the, the only thing that we are defining is access to video frames. Right. And we, we want it to be efficient. So it's still a requirement that somehow uh, we, we need to manage. And I think we have done it uh, to the best we, we can. So uh, I'm fine either way, uh, as long as we understand uh, how and what's the scope of the requirement. And the requirement scope is uh, related to the things we are defining only, and not to the web in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think I agree with your analysis that uh, probably isn't anything specific the web artist working group needs to address um the only open question in my mind 
and I, it's a truly open question, I don't have an answer, is whether ensuring or reducing the risk of memory copies uh, across the various ways uh, machine learning could happen, as you say, compared to media manipulation, machine learning could happen right. through uh, CPU or other processing units, whether any requirements from, from that need uh, would be derived in the context of encoded transform. But otherwise, yeah. if we don't know of, or if we don't think there is any, then I think it's pretty fine. Yeah, so, so that is an important question, Dom. And in fact, in the media working group, we are discussing, for example, color conversion with cop video frame copy to. Um, there's now in, I believe, the web GPU working group, a uh, function to convert between video frame and web GPU external textures. So these things are being worked on, but not in this working group. Uh, Tim? Yeah, I think just to put this in context, I think this is another one which has been pretty much overtaken by events. Um, mm. You know, and, and like you could argue that it's been achieved. And I think when it was written, we had no idea kind right, of right. what these APIs would look like. And, and now they're there. So I think it's, it's fair to say that it can, that it's done its job to some extent. I mean, it didn't turn out the way maybe we might have expected, but it, like, it's available now. So it comes down to this thing about whether we want to keep uh, things in a document somewhere, which are valid use cases, but that don't actually need anything new done by us. Um, and, and this is a, like a prime example of that. I don't think there's anything that we need to do for this now. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, I don't want to say it's not something you can do with WebRTC because it clearly is. Right. Right, right. We're not saying that we, W3C doesn't care about machine learning anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, we're definitely not saying that. But well, uh, well, but 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 subtler that when we're saying that WebRTC should be able to cooperate effectively with machine mm -hmm. learning APIs, mm -hmm. and that's not a given. And like when we first right. brought out WebRTC, there was no way of of accessing yeah. the frames at all. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, it's it's not even a given today, right? Because we're there's actually activity activity in the media working group to try to remove copies, as Dom said. So it's not like it's even even proven that we can do, you know. Certainly, a lot of machine learning stuff we know we can't do on the web uh, efficiently. Any other comments? Let me let me uh, yeah, Yanivar. Uh, yeah, so it, it seems to me that N twenty two was just. Um... A convenient it seems like a superset requirement and at the time we we know we wanted funny hats and machine learning and this requirement satisfied both but sort of. maybe yeah i guess yes, i would claim wondering... that it only really satisfies funny hats because if you were going to do machine learning you'd need efficient and you know npus and other you know wasm simd it would okay i was going to say uh, i was going to suggest to break out a separate requirement that replaces manipulation with processing but maybe Hmm. You have more info there. All right, thanks. Harold? I think this requirement was actually misguided in our, its formulation in that we need efficient media manipulation. And uh, tying this to GPUs was a mistake. Hmm. There are many, many things that uh, preclude efficient media manipulation and and uh, not not all of them are solved by by in, by chanting GPU GPU GPU. Right. Certainly, I think it's fair to is it fair to say, Harold, that in audio there isn't that much of the GPU used for for either manipulation or uh, or machine learning for that matter. Oh, it, there might there might be, but not yeah. uh, in the not not in the current configurations. Yeah. Okay, so you're suggesting that N22 should be revised even for funny hats, and uh, doesn't necessarily even make sense there. Thank you. Yep. So let me ask the question again. Is are there objections to removing uh, the machine learning use case section 3.7? Okay, not not hearing that. I'm all, but I'm also want to put down uh, Harold's uh, recommendation to update N22 for funny hats. All right, 
So I'm going to turn this over to Tim, who has uh, some more discussion of dew points. Yeah, so, so um, what we've been talking about kind of uh, highlights this, this, the two remaining questions, which I kind of want to bring up. I don't expect to get a resolution of them now, but, but you know, do we... Um, how do we move how do we shape the documents in 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 the future and kind of we're saying that this document shouldn't do some things and um and we've also said last last month that we felt that explainers were a really useful thing to do and so i kind of want some sort of guidance about like written guidance about how this should work um you know what the relationship is between an explainer and the nv use cases document if it if there is one uh, and, um, you know, conversely, if we're making API changes, maybe they should refer back to a document or add a use case. Like, um, you know, so, so uh, all the small changes in capture that have come along have been about use cases of, well, hey, we want to protect the user from doing this or we want to make it easier for the user to do that. But there are no use cases directly in the document that talk about them, or there are at a high level. So I'm trying to work out what we think the relationship should be between any new documents we might want to try and create and, and the existing document and explainers and, yeah. Um, uh, not a very coherent question, but I, but I think we need a shape. Um, I see Dom in the queue. Yes, for person proposal, uh, and I haven't put a lot of thoughts into it, uh, but, but uh, I wonder if a solution might be to keep this uh, use case document for use cases and requirements that don't have a home yet, and so in particular don't have uh, an API which hopefully is accompanied by an explainer that indeed would have the more detailed use case and requirements analysis. So basically this would be uh, a place where we park things that we know we want to do, but nobody has put the effort in going to the next level of detail, which usually would be again, an explainer possibly accompanied with uh, some initial uh, API shape or something. So, um, that, that would make the document, I guess, um, a lot less complete than what we have, uh, but it would avoid duplication. It would clarify responsibilities in terms of uh, who owns the use case on what uh, APIs. Uh, and so maybe the goal would be for this document to shrink over time, or, or as I'm sure we'll keep having new ideas that we don't have time to implement, to have it as a reservoir of ideas. Uh, Yaniva. Yes, yeah, so, so I think uh, this, use, this use case document uh, satisfies a different purpose than explainers. I think uh, this document, this is where we put ideas and what we, we wish to, this is where we wish, problems we wish to solve and describe the problems we wish to solve. An explainer, I think, is what comes out at the end, uh, necessary for tag reviews as well, uh, that explains the API we have built to solve the problems that we described here originally. So I think we need, uh, I don't think explainers remove the need for early use case discussions, put it that way. So just to make sure I understand, you know, uh, I agree with you. I guess my point was once we have an explainer, we are out of the early use case phase. Uh, and if we are, then it may be clearer to remove it from that document where it creates duplication and possibly confusion. Hmm. Well, explainers usually, they tell a story of, uh, I have this problem and, and here's how I use this API to solve it, right? Which is more detailed and JavaScript focused than I think this document is. But yeah, there might be some redundancy. I can see that. But not. Yeah, so I, I do want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about your first point, which is proposed API changes should include changes to the use case stock. I guess, you know, because there is this weird relationship, right? We've For a while, there were a bunch of use cases which didn't have any proposals. 
And then there have also been proposals that don't seem to be covered by any of the use cases. And that does seem a little bit odd. Um, so I guess the solution to the first problem is that if we say something's a problem, we should try to address it. And we've made a little bit more progress with things like the ice controller and RTP transport. But um, I do wonder about the second one where people come here and say, hey, I want to do this and there's no use case. Um, what, do we, what do we say about that? Yeah, Dom. Yeah, I think we already have uh, not thoroughly applied rule that any significant proposal should come with an explainer. And one reason for that is we need it for tag review. Um, and again, an explainer is supposed to describe uh, fairly detailed use cases that lets you understand what you want to achieve. So. In my mind, when someone is already at the stage of formulating a proposal, we should insist on having the explainer that uh, accompanies it, not necessarily having it described in a use case in that document. In particular, if we move towards that uh, sequencing I was describing where uh, this document is for early, we think we know we need that, but we don't know quite sure how to approach it uh, towards the later phase where uh, we have this proposal and it fulfills that set of use cases. So I think if I kind of can maybe try and summarize that discussion, the feeling is that this document is should in fact maybe be a queue. It's, a, it's the input queue. Uh, of things that for which there are not yet explainers or proposals. And as things are either taken off it or age off it, it gets shorter and longer. So it's a dynamic, much more dynamic document than it has been, which I, I think I'm in favor of. Um, and I think, so maybe it, it needs to be renamed again, like future use cases or something, um, to be clear that it doesn't, we don't do them yet. Um, which then leaves my remaining worry that we have a bunch of, and, and massively a bunch of use cases that we really want to support, that we do support, that we implement, that we work for, that aren't in 70, 74, 78, uh, and, and, I, and that we don't claim to be trying to do at a high level. And I, I think we need some way of resolving that. And, and I don't think it's this document. I think I think it's clear from the group that this document needs a much narrower, much more dynamic purpose. But I do think that we need a another uh, place to say these are the kinds of problems that WebRTC is is solving today and will continue to solve in the future. Does okay. that make sense? I, I think. We'll, we'll just let Harold uh, talk, and then I think we're out of time. Yeah, Harold? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I worry a bit uh, because of the difficulties I had in getting things into the queue, into the queue <laughs> where it actually seemed to be easier to write, uh, write an explainer of how I want to do something. Uh, I mean, explainers should include why I want to do something and how I want to do something. It's easier to write that than to get uh, uh, get consensus for for adding a, a use case to the to the uh, the working group should have a solution for this document. Maybe easier so, to ship. Yeah, I mean, uh, if 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 it's if if it has a, if there has to be a point if if, if there's a point in listing things we don't do yet then the barrier to entry must be low because otherwise it's easier to do them than to describe what you plan to what what you wish that that someone would be doing and that doesn't make sense i i that's true from within where you're sitting but getting things done from where i'm sitting by a browser vendor is a big ask so like I think there's a bunch of kind of developer requirements that are pretty much impossible to implement without getting somebody on board. 
to help them implement it. And on that cheery note, I think we should uh, move on to ICE Controller. Samir and Peter. Yep. Hi, Samir here. Uh, so this slide is really uh, just a call for feedback on the PR about the issue that I talked about last month, which is to prevent candidate pair removal. Uh, there has been some feedback, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we can skip this as just a uh, one topic uh, of feedback that I would like to discuss uh, later. So if you can skip ahead uh, two slides, please. We can skip this. Yep. So uh, while I'm waiting for feedback on the PR, I went ahead and created uh, issues for the next two items on the list. Uh, these issues address what we would do with a candidate, what an application would do with a candidate pair once it has prevented it from being removed. And there's really two things we can do: uh, either remove it at some point in the future explicitly, or use a candidate pair to transport media. So next slide. So this issue is for removing a candidate pair by the application, fairly straightforward. Uh, we would add a method on RDC ICE transport to prune candidate pairs, prune, remove, we can talk about what makes sense. Uh, prune here matches the event in the previous proposal uh, on ICE candidate prune, so, or ICE candidate pair prune, so uh, prune I think makes sense. And what would happen when the application invokes prune candidate pairs is that the ICE agent would stop sending or responding to stunt checks on that candidate pair, and uh, it would no longer be available for use by the transport. Uh, so that's one. And then on the next slide is the ability to actually select a candidate pair, a different candidate pair than what the ICE agent has selected. Uh, this one's a bit more interesting, so we would want to do this without a nice restart or without waiting for a nice disconnect. Uh, the exact implementation of this is open to discussion. So uh, if we are going to be deviating from the spec by allowing the application to actually change the ICE behavior, then uh, it's open to discussion exactly what approach we should take, whether uh, uh, a browser is uh, free to open, uh, implement it in a certain way. Uh, uh, the application, of course, would need to ensure that the other end understands and follows the same protocol for selecting transport. Uh, so to make things a bit more clearer, uh, what happens uh, with Vanilla Ice uh, for nomination is the controlling side selects a pair it sends a stun check with the use candidate attribute set. Uh, set. Uh, the control side will respond to that and on receipt of successful uh, response, uh, the controlling agent will set the pair to be nominated. Uh, the control side will do the same thing on receipt of the first request. And then uh, that's when uh, the pair gets nominated. Uh, the alternative would be to just take the pair that the application is uh, indicating and start sending uh, media on that immediately. Uh, presumably the pair is still active, so it is safe to do that. Uh, but of course, uh, a more cautious approach would be to do the stun check uh, back and forth. And once that's been successful, then actually start sending media on that candidate pair. Uh, so there's a few things to discuss here. Uh, maybe if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this slide, uh, let's maybe take this in reverse. So since I spoke just now about uh, how setting candidate pairs might work, uh, maybe we can talk about that first. Uh, the slide is phrased a bit in terms of what the API looks like, but I think the discussion is a bit broader than that. Uh, what should be the approach by the browser to actually set a selected candidate pair? Uh, and then how does that reflect in the API? It is uh, 
on asynchronous operations. So I think it makes sense to return a promise that gets resolved at a future point. Uh, for instance, when the stem checks are successfully received uh, and a pair is nominated, the alternative would be to return immediately and then let the selected candidate pair change event actually notify the application that the selection was successful or it was not, not successful based on the lack of an event. So thoughts? Yanivar? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, were you if if you go on the promised route, were you, would you also fire the events? Is that are the events? Do the modification methods trigger the events? Mm -hmm. I know we've had both models. Right. Uh, yeah. So the event is an existing event already in the spec, so we would have to fire the event as well. Yes. So then uh, you could then block your own. Uh, pruning or uh, well, going back to the prune api for example you could call prune and then you get the event and then they could block you could set prevent default and then you would not prune which seems a bit awkward and foot gunny um i'm not sure i follow so so uh sorry so in this case uh prune in this case would not actually uh fire the prune propo or what I previously called the prune proposal event. No. So uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I misunderstood which event you were referring to. So no, prune would not fire the event. Prune immediately <laughs> prunes the candidates without an event. Without the event firing. Okay, and, and that seems like we should be consistent with that here then too then. Mm -hmm. And uh whether you need a promise or not, I mean uh, can it fail? I mean if it cannot fail the only benefit of that, you know, you had a promise so that you can either allow failure or that you want to know the time point in time that things are are are, are done, I guess. Right. But if so, not, then. Yeah. Uh, so further along in the list of uh, additions is another event for deletion, which cannot be cancelled. And so that would be an event that indicates when pruning is complete, for instance, and the candidate pair has been deleted. Uh, so that I think makes more sense. Uh, with regards to failure, the only uh, reasonable reason why I can think this would fail is if you are trying to prune a candidate pair that doesn't actually exist uh, because you would just pass a dictionary that can be anything, uh, in which case, sorry. sorry. I should have clarified uh, if there's anything that cannot that can fail asynchronously, that cannot be caught synchronously. Mm -hmm. Like so input validation and stuff, you could still have a synchronous method and still do input validation. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. And that was a proposal. So in, in the case of prune, I do not uh, think there is anything that fails asynchronously, which is why I think it makes sense to be synchronous. But for set selected, you think there is? Uh, for set selected, again, depending on uh, how we do the implementation, presumably there are things that can fail asynchronously. So, for instance, if we do the stun use candidate uh, back and forth, then the response could be lost, in which case it fails asynchronously, in which case the promise resolves uh, fails asynchronously. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Jan? Um, yeah, continuing in prune set selected, uh, is, is it fine to prune the currently selected uh, candidate pair? Uh, that's yep. probably uh, not a great idea, but um, I guess that if we allow it, then that's good. If we do not allow it, then uh, prune will somehow need to be async. So I'm wondering whether there are still some async cases where uh, pruning would not do anything or any would be good to let the application but it's not doing anything mm -hmm. uh so yeah so in the issue i have actually mentioned that uh, it is perfectly valid to prune the currently selected candidate pair in which case it would be the equivalent of the care pair going away for any other reason for instance a network interface going away in which case you would select or sorry you would trigger the selection of a different candidate pair or ice failure whatever yeah i, I guess if if you dynamically change, uh switched to the 
selected candidate pair just at the time that you prune, you might actually prune the selected candidate pair without knowing it. Uh, because I'm guessing that one state is happening in the network process, in the network thread, and the other one is, of course, in the main thread. So I'm wondering whether there might be some race conditions there and some bad edge cases with. Uh, so maybe it's fine to put in selected candidate pair, but uh, mm. maybe if you start with trying to put this candidate pair and you know it's not the selected one in the main thread, maybe uh, when you are actually in the network thread, you would not like to to prune it at that time. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's worth some put there. Um, mm. Uh, I see that prune is taking a sequence. Uh, I'm guessing it's for perf reasons that you, you do just one hop. Uh, is that correct? Because otherwise you could like prune a candidate pair and call it several times instead of uh, having to create a, a sequence. But I was wondering what was the, the best approach here. Uh, maybe it should be like, uh, like in uh, a dot, 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 like you, you prune candidate pair for my candidate pair two uh, and so on. I, I don't know what's uh, the best approach here, um, mm -hmm. but that's uh, another comment. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's it. Yeah, uh, your justification, presumed justification for that is correct. So yeah, for optimization, if you have several candidate pairs you want to get rid of together, make one call. Of course, uh, it's open for discussion. Uh, Tim? Yeah, I, I think it would be good to um, to have a sequence because if you're going to get rid of several, you don't want it to suddenly start using one you're just about to delete. That's inefficiency. Uh, so I think having a sequence is a good good strategy. Um, I'm slightly worried that this API doesn't take account of any kind of the fact that one side is controlling and the other side is controlled and that the behavior will be different. Are you confident you can mask that difference on the two sides so that it looks the same to the user? Mm. Mm. So, right. So right now, yeah, the main so the way that uh, controlling versus control impacts the API right now is subselected fails immediately if you try to call it on the control side. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure I follow uh, what you might be suggesting. Uh, you maybe... uh, exactly that what you've just mm -hmm. said, but I, I hadn't. I hadn't picked that up. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I feel like there's a bunch of of there may be some other asymmetricalities, maybe in the timing and things, that um, uh, yeah, that, that affect that. But anyway, um, maybe that's for detail in on the list or somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can. Uh, I mean, once I have a PR out for that, we can certainly discuss the specifics of uh, what happens there, uh, Peter. I actually think we should allow the controlled side to override and uh, set the selected candidate pair. But I agree with Tim that it should be something clear that they're doing, right? There should be some opt-in to say, I don't care what the other side says. I want to do my own thing. Right. I think there's definitely uh, an opportunity to do to do that because the fact that the application uses these implies that the application is taking a certain responsibility in making sure that the connection will actually work on the other end as well. Uh, and if we open up that possibility, then we should theoretically also open up the possibility of the control side selecting a certain pair. So uh, yeah, I think that might actually make sense. Uh, any thoughts about uh, selection by immediately sending media versus uh, doing a stun exchange? Anyone? 
Uh, sorry, I, I didn't jump in uh, to answer that question. Sorry, uh, I had a different question though. Um, I, I'm I'm just nervous that uh, for the ice transport in general, it's running asynchronously, and peer condition is a huge state machine. How are these change? How do we imagine these changes working with, with you know a negotiation, ice restart, and that kind of stuff? Like uh, it seems like there could be a lot of races. Mm -hmm. Uh, like uh, would an ice restart, for instance, uh, uh, reverse all these decisions? Is uh, that a clean slate? Yes, I would think ice restart would be a clean slate, and mm -hmm. yes, it would reverse those decisions. Are there, like, what if I uh, negotiate and add a transceiver, for example? Mm -hmm. Any. Um, Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, think, I guess I need to yeah, formulate a better question, but yeah, I'll, I'll think about races. Uh, I think Tim was next. Yeah, to, to answer your question about um, whether it should do the ice round trip or not, and I think it should. Um, I, I think you need, you're going to need to tell the other side some way that this is what's going to happen. And I think if you don't, then you'll end up completely messing up things like bandwidth estimation and all sorts of, of other fun. Um, so I, I think think you definitely need to do that and the two sides need to agree it. And um, and this is going to be the quickest way to do it. There's no other, like you could send a thing, a message over the data channel or something, but it would take longer than, a, than the ICE protocol. So uh, I think that's the right way to do it. Yeah. And that probably also might, to some extent, uh, address uh, doing a change like this in the state machine and uh, sort of work a bit well with that. Uh, I think Peter is next, and then I'll come back to you, Yanimar. Yeah, so two things. One on the ice restart question. Ice restarts are make before break, and typically what they're really doing is just adding candidate pairs. Um, so the question is, would a newly added candidate pair be able to override your previously selected candidate pair if the application specifically selected a candidate pair? And I don't know the answer to that, but it is something we should choose either way. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to say that the application should be in control and not have it changed at it, under it, but I could see an argument the other way. On the question of, um, I think you were talking about the candidate, the, the selected candidate pair being the same pair for both sides. And Tim was talking about bandwidth estimation. There's no reason the candidate pairs need to be both the same. Both sides could pick different candidate pairs and the congestion control will work just fine. Uh, one using one candidate pair and another using candidate pair. There's there's really no reason they have to be the same. Um, but I I didn't quite understand the original question that Tim was trying to answer. Can you repeat the question? So what I no, thought, no, no. well no, I should say what I thought the question was, but like <laughs> whichever. That was Samir to answer the or re repeat the question. Uh, sure. I think my uh, the question you're referring to is uh, was it about the uh, something about the, round trip of right, Star right. Check. So yeah, so you uh, right now with ICE, you do uh, you nominate a candidate pair by sending a stun check with use candidate attribute set. And then the control side responds to that. And then the control side sends its own check and waits for a response. And once that exchange is complete, that's when you actually start using that candidate pair. Uh, with, I think, 8445, you can still send media until a candidate pair has been selected on any valid pair. But then once a valid pair has been selected, you have to do, uh, you have to send media on that. And so that was the uh, question is if we are okay. selecting a different pair, do we actually just start? Are, are I, we okay just sending media or do we do the exchange? Okay, th then I would be strongly in favor of sending media immediately on the one you called set selected on. You want that to be as 
responsive as possible. And there's really no reason to wait for another round trip because the, the only reason you'd select it is if it's receiving uh, check responses that are working already. So why wait for another round trip? I, I don't see a good reason for that. So on that note, I think we are out of time and need to go to the next section. All right, so now we're gonna turn it over to Harold. Let's go. I'll try to go quickly through the what I said in March. <clears throat> I was when I was uh, making the slides. I thought, oh, I'll just put up the slide set from last month. But uh, it turned out to have been March. Oh well, time flies. Next slide. So problem. You you set up a connection, negotiate set of codex. Sender inserts the transform, change the format. Receiver by autoband means knows that it has to reverse re, reverse the transform. No problem, right? But uh, yes, there is a problem. It's that what you are negotiating doesn't match what you are sending, which makes life more complicated. Complexity is bad. So a solution should be. If you negotiate something, if you send something, you should negotiate that. Next. So we have the transform model. STP negotiation call, talks to the encoder and trans, and the packetizer. It does not talk to the transform. Next slide. So what the solution we I came up with was to make the browser capabilities and SDP negotiation actually talk to the application, or rather have the application talk to it. Next. So the application knows that it is going to send certain formats that are not what uh, the browser implements. They going to be encrypted or inverted or enhanced or or an annotated or whatever the application wants. And it should tell the STP module. These are formats that you need to, to agree with the other side to send and receive. And if su such uh, negotiation is successful, tell the encoder what format to encode to and that and tell the packetizer how to packetize this thing. So the rest of the system operates as normal. Next. So I tried to sketch out the minimum API changes that I needed to achieve this. So, if we negotiate the codec that the browser doesn't know about, it has to know how to packetize it. Bernard? Yeah, I guess my question, and I guess Fippo commented on the GitHub, is what, it, what does it mean to not know about it? And know about it in what sense? How is that defined for both packetization mode and the capability? Well, for packetization mode, the browser has to know about it because I'm not proposing to switch to a a packetized packet API uh, for the actual content of the frame. Not knowing about it means that if you pass this to a browser decoder, any browser decoder, the browser decoder will not be able to decode it because it needs a transform applied to it before. So if so it. it, it for decoder. example, if there's a web codex decoder, that means it's known? And no, that's not part of WebRTC. Oh, okay. Just, all right. Yeah, so that's, uh, so we're within the context of WebRTC. Uh, codex that are implemented by web codex and nobody else would be an example of uh, things where you have to pull the frame out of the 
the chain and passed them to something that is not WebRTC. And uh, that could be JavaScript for all I care. WebAssembly, WebGPU. Well, so before we negotiate, you have to add the send code capability. I'm capable of generating this. Add receiver code capability. I'm capable of decoding this. Again, the application has to tell the STP that this is going to happen. And then you do the, do the negotiation. You have created the senders and receivers in a perfectly ordinary manner, except that some of these senders and receivers are now marked as being able to send and receive a codex that we haven't seen before. And then we have to tell the sender encoder if we use it at all and what to encode to. So for instance, we can have VP8 encoding Set encoding codec to VP8, then take the output of that encoding, transform it using S frame, and send it on a, as a, a payload type that is tagged as VP8 plus S frame, or even S frame, you have to look inside to figure out that it's VP8. And similar, we have to add a decoding codec on the other end. Next. Example code. I don't want to go through this in detail. And note that I used, I reused uh, MIME types for practicization mode. I think that should be fairly obvious in most cases. And in most cases, you would want to choose a simple practicization mode, i.e. not H264. And uh, next, receiver, same thing. Note that uh, there's a payload type here that is outside of the range of legal payload types for STP. Yeah, that's an example of, you don't have to use a payload type that can be expressed in, in uh, RTP to identify the coding decoder you want to send this to. That's a local matter. It doesn't go on the wire. Next. So I have an actual PR. This is closely following the proposal I made March. Add some explainer document and add some API changes. I discovered that I needed to access some functionality from WebRTC PC and uh, those were in uh, places where uh, uh, those were in places where where uh, they were not exported. So I have an issue raised on WebRTC PC to get that one exported. So uh, replying to Dom's to Yuan's question, I don't think any. Uh, IDF work is needed here, is absolutely necessary here, as long as we admit of sending STP MIME types that have not been standardized for practicization. So I started the implementation in Mar at IDF Hackathon in March. I haven't followed it up later, but uh, yeah, so it's not yet functional. But I didn't find the showstoppers yet. I was capable of getting uh, getting the new STP into the list of things being negotiated, but uh, not. Uh, I didn't get as far as to get them back into the list of things that had been negotiated. So still working. Uh, Janiva. 
Uh, yes, thank you for explaining. I think this makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, I had some questions about how it works. Um, I, I see there are pre-negotiation methods, uh, which makes sense. But then, um, and and then a negotiation will happen. So I guess uh, the other side may decide to reject uh, payload types. Yes. But then, I see you also have a method, a set encoding codec on the sender and receiver. I'm wondering if those are needed or if we could just reuse existing APIs. If these new codecs, why can't these codecs be set the way we set codecs every every other codec? I think they I think they should be set the way that uh, Florent is currently proposing for setting codecs. It's just that I didn't uh, make my slides consistent with his proposal yet. Great, that would make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I have Tim on the queue. Yeah, m much against my better judgment, I do see the necessity for involving SDP in this. Um, one thing I worry about is what ha how do we deal with the kind of um, scope rules of SDP? How are you going to deal with things like RTX and uh, all of the other Bits where where STP scopes bleed into other parts of the of, of themselves. Like if you know, um, yeah. How, how does that how does that work? It would be uh, um, uh, correct to say that I haven't figured that one out yet. So uh, at the moment we have a very imprecise surface for deciding what kind of uh, protection features we are want to turn on. I think the current API for doing that is called STP merging, merging, and that's sad. So I think we should figure that one out and then start doing it also for this case. That's a non. That's a not an answer, but it's uh, de de deferring to previously unsolved problem. I think. Yeah, Nivar. So just, um, uh, I mean, this is early. Maybe this is bike shedding, but I'm wondering. I see there's only methods to add things, not to remove things. And then I was thinking, well, maybe why isn't this part of set configuration or something like that? But but th this is bike shedding, I guess. So we could do that later. Uh, I thought I thought about adding adding uh, adding removing, but then uh, again, I we we're, we're able to turn off using the negotiated codex by just uh, removing them from the M line. From the, from the from the set codec references list, right, right. So we can stop using them. So I thought that let's not add features until we need them. Uh, with set configuration, I like small sharp APIs, but uh, and so, so I so I usually want to have API functions instead of. Uh, adding yet another subdirectory but it's a, it's a possibility yeah, that so what do people think should we adopt this for um as uh, something that the the working group want, wants to add? I see it comes up from Yandivar. Well, Yandivar and I have consensus. We. Oui. I see more thumbs up. <laughs> yep. 
I think we have a decision. We're adopting, we're, we're adopting this and the details will work them out on PR. I'm happy to take comments. And we'll get the codec, uh, codec setting fixed. Uh, just noting, I, I see uh, in comments, uh, UN said he needed to drop off. He'll try to comment on the issue. Main question is which ITF work would be needed. Payload, payload type setter on the frame seems fine. Yeah, just, just a word about that, Yanivar. Um, there is a draft in the ISG evaluation now, which is pretty close to what Harold is proposing. It's for a protocol called SKIP, which does end-to-end -end encryption. But basically, it says, hey, this thing is, is you know, something else. Like, uh, it's known as SKIP. Um, the ISG is still trying to get their head around the idea that something is encrypted end to end in an SDP and negotiated, but hopefully they'll, they'll get over that little hump soon. All right, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> we found out. Yeah. Well, this is, this is encoded according to a spec that's secret. Well, why can't I find the spec on the web? Well, because it's secret. Yeah, well, that, uh, that, that, it's been interesting to watch that discussion. But anyway, we're, we're, head, we're heading in this direction. That's good. I'm done. Are we ahead of time? Yes, we're ahead of time. So on uh, on this this one next step is uh, take comment take comments on the issue and address them. Wait, did we get to the board? I'll leave it to Bernard to wrap up. So we had uh, Harold said for his notes uh, take comments on this one. I think for the next NV one, um, just a question for Dom if he's still around. Do we need to do a CFC on the PRs that we had, or we just can remove the use cases? Um, I don't know if around. Um, I, I don't have a strong feeling. I think we probably can just remove them. Okay. But it's really up to you to assess the level of consensus you've seen. Okay. Um, are there any other things that people feel were or next steps or things we need to track uh, before the next meeting? Uh, all right, then I think we've actually gotten to the bird slide for the first time in a while. Um, these are two birds that were at Butterfly World in Florida. Uh, I believe they're macaws. Anyway, they have pretty sharp claws, but generally leave people alone. Are they, okay. name, are they name, name, named for their voice? Uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what they sound like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they were named for that, but that is what they sound like. Anyway, uh, I think we're done a little bit ahead of time. That's amazing. Uh, and we will see everybody in July. Florence suggests naming them Alice and Bob. See you then. Okay. Bye.